Speaking of uh, offerings and so forth, um, today's message title uh, is Red Man. And when you think about a red man, I mean, obviously something, a lot of different things can come. It could be an embarrassed man. It could be a Native American man or woman. Um, but today we're not really talking about either one of those, although there might be a little bit of that in there. Uh, so let's start off, though, first with... Uh, kind of a, pre- a preface on this message is one of the things I really wanted to get across to you, and I, I don't know why um, this, I, I, I should say I don't know why, I do know why, I just hate that it is what it is. Um, the scripture is very clear to, you know, it says you know, to not be just a hearer of the word, but to be an effectual doer of the word. Um, we've talked about um, in multiple sermons, multiple messages, and multiple, you know, um, just me, either me speaking to you or, or personally or privately or whatever the case may be as individuals, the necessity for change and the necessity for growth, and that necessitates introspection and self-evaluation and adhering to the counsel of, why, uh, of those whom God has placed in your path um, that provide that wisdom for you so that you won't be deceived. The easiest person to deceive is not someone else, it's yourself. So that's why I always say the deceived know not they're deceived because you can fool yourself very easily into believing that you're something that you're not or to believing that you're in a condition or a state of being that you're not. And so you have to be willing to to look in that spiritual mirror and accept the reality of the of God of the reflection that's shining back at you to see um, where it is that you're falling short, where the inadequacies are, where the openings are, where you know the dark spots, where the blemishes and the wrinkles and those things that you need um, to iron out and to get rid of really and truthfully are and not to just say, no, I'm good. Um, no, I, I feel okay. I feel fine. Well, that really doesn't have anything to do with it. I mean, sometimes you might feel fine and you might be in a, a horrible, terrible a mess, spiritually, eternally, mentally, whatever, right? I mean, so it's not just on how you feel, but some things, when you have strongholds in your life, they can be hidden down deep on the inside, and those strongholds might last the entirety of most people's lives. And those strongholds are problematic because those, pro- those strongholds are what we call insecurities um, and iniquity. Um, and so this, this, I use the word insecurity because insecurity means not secure. So you're not secure in your identity in whom God says you are. Instead, you're secure in your identity that's tainted by what Satan has implanted or you, you've allowed to be implanted. So that's the insecurity aspect of it. The iniquity aspect of it you know, it goes back to the, the Hebrew where it's talking about things that are present in our lives, again, that need to change. It's not just solely indicative of sin. It's also indicative of bad thought behaviors and bad thought patterns and ways of thinking that are ungodly. Or even that can also mean that, well, that doesn't necessarily mean lust, but it, also, it can also mean the ways that you see yourself. Or... Ways that you may not even be aware of and what you put yourself above God. And many people say, no, I would never do that. You know, I would never, I would never do that. I mean, I know that's an idol and I've, anything I put above God is an idol. I would never do that. But, it's, but you're not really looking accurately at yourself in the mirror. You know, you're, you're looking, you, gotta, you, know, you have a filter on like on your phone. And, you know, the person on the other end with all the filters and the lighting and all that, that's not anything. I don't know if y'all seen some of that, uh, by the way, like if you look on these different social media platforms, um, if you, you find, you know, be it a male, attractive male or attractive female, and you look at them and they sometimes have, it's kind of like makeup versus no makeup, but you put the makeup on, you put the lighting just right, and then you put the filter on, I mean, it can change a 90-year-old woman into an attractive, you know, 45-year-old woman 
with, with all that, and you would never know the difference. I mean, it's just, it's mind-blowing, you know, it's just, it's almost CGI, right? But I think sometimes that's exactly what we do in our mind's eyes. We apply filters, and we apply our own lighting, but it's not God's lighting, and it's not God's reality. We, we're not really looking at and seeing what's really there because we don't want to. So my objective with today's message is, is for you to get honest with yourself because time is drawing short. Do you want to grow? Do you want to get closer to God? Do you want God's blessing in your life? Do you want to become more like Him? Or do you just want to keep going along to get along? Do you, because there's so many people that, that are here even, that have been going to, to church for over a decade and there's been this much growth. Just tiny, tiny growth. Now, it's interesting because they'll have spurts of growth where it's like, well, oh man, that person's really doing good right now. But then it's, it's short-stayed. It's just, it's over with. And then they're right back to doing what they were doing, thinking, behaving, acting, and as if no one sees and as if no one knows. But we're a close-knit family. We're the body of Christ. And with that being said, we're called to love one another, encourage one another, support one another, and rebuke one another, admonish one another, correct one another. Right? And it's not that you have to, you know, that we're always walking around on eggshells like that, because that, you know, it's not, like, and it's not that we're always pointing fingers. But the reality should be that we love each one other enough to give each other space, to not be busybodies and be all up in each other's business, but at the same time to love one another to where we do see a problem, to help correct it, to help encourage and to help love one another, to lift people up out of it so they can become closer to God. I liken it this way kind of when I think about it in context of to training, right, and to self-protection. If I see a guy that, that, that's, that's really has poor, let's just say maybe it's firearm, right, training, because that makes it a little bit more clear. Maybe his, boy, he's got... You know, he says everything's fine. He says everything's doing good. But I noticed that every time he draws his gun out of the holster, holster, he almost shoots his toe off. Almost every single time. Right? Should I say something? Or should I just pretend that nah, that's, that's just the way he is? That's cool. You know? That's the way God made him. Or do I say, say hey, listen, man, maybe you don't want to keep your finger off the trigger when you're drawing your weapon and not put it on the trigger until you're on target with whatever you're willing to either kill or, or destroy, right? Whether it be a target or whether it be a, you know, a can or whatever it might be. But you know, don't put your finger on the trigger until it's on target. I should say something about that because what I don't want is I don't want to go into to battle with that guy and then him either shoot me or shoot himself or give away our position or any other myriad number of things that could happen, right? So it's the same way as it translates over into our walk with Christ. I, w I want each person to be armed up and be battle ready so that when we put out a prayer request, they're ready. They can come before God. They're in God's presence. They're as close to God as they can be so that the, they, they can go to fight on our behalf and on behalf of each other. Because things are going to get worse. We know that. And if you can't handle your business while things are good, how are you going to handle it when things are bad? You can only fake the training for so long. You can only fake your condition for so long. You can only fake your reflection for so long. I think I've told you about this, you know, so many times. This is very, very old now, you know, but, you know, when I, when I first I was doing, you know, the... the uh, health and healing teaching seminars all over the country and you know when we would talk about things like um, Epsom salt baths and essential oil baths and we had a product out that it combined Epsom salt with certain essential oils and other certain minerals or whatever and you put it you put it in your bath water and it was uh, not only relax you but it would detoxify and draw toxins out of the out of your body and do all that kind of stuff but you had to stay in the bath for like 20 minutes or whatever and and um, it was a serious deal, and it, it was relaxing, it was fine, but it worked really, really well in terms of detoxifying. I mean, it wasn't like you get out, yeah, I think I feel different. You'd get out of it, of the bath, and the water would literally be a different color, you know, from the toxins that would come out of your body, depending on how, to how toxic you were. Um, 
The problem that we found was is that most people, men included, but specifically women, couldn't sit in the bath that long. A lot of people, a lot of women say, oh, I enjoy a bath or whatever, but the reality is is that many of them can't enjoy the bath because they can't sit still for that long or that period of time because they, they start thinking, thinking about all the things that they need to do, thinking about all, sometimes their emotions start to come up of trauma and things they haven't dealt with. And so they have to keep themselves busy, 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 busy so they can cover it all up. And that's not what we want. We, don't, we want to be able to be still and know that he's God, to meditate upon his word, to look at the inadequacies, to look at the um, places where there are all those blemishes and wrinkles and be able to address them so that we can be ready for battle and not give the enemy any room. You can't just say, well, that's just the way I was made. That's just the way I was created because the devil is a liar. God created you in his image, not the devil's. And let me just reiterate this. If you don't hear anything else today, maybe just this one point, maybe you, this will register with some of you here who need to hear it. That is, if it's time to grow up. And I don't mean that in the terms of age. I mean that in terms of spirituality. It's time to get real and it's time to grow up. It's time to deal with your issues. It's time to get in God's presence and it's time to start growing. Um, because the time for, for, you know, for playing is, it was, it was, was always over. The time for faking it was always over. It was never acceptable. It was never okay. And there is going to become a time where you're going to be left out and unprotected because you've left yourself exposed. And the enemy will have access to you, but not to the rest of the people who are growing. And so in essence, what you'll be doing is you're, you're in effect, you, you're... you're you're not only harming yourself, but you're self-ostracizing. You're removing yourself from the body of Christ. And of course, once that happens, the natural thing to do, and I say this natural, meaning earthly, natural, demonic thing to do, is to point fingers at everybody and say it's their fault, his fault, her fault. It's everybody's fault but your own. Because that's what the enemy is, the, who he is. He's the accuser of the brethren. And so you're no longer part of the brethren, so what's your job now? Your job now lies in the power of the dark one. So now it's your job to point fingers and accuse the brethren. Nothing has ever changed since the inception of mankind, since Christ, since not before Christ, since the Garden of Eden, right? It's always the same. The enemy's got the same kind of uh, plan all along. He can't create anything new, so he just duplicates everything old. It just calls it something different, tweaks it a little bit. So it's time to change and time to look at your inadequacies, to look at your weaknesses and make them strengths. I've preached on this so many times in the past, and here it is again today. Because there's a lot of you that aren't growing, and it causes me concern and fear for your salvation and fear for your life, spiritually speaking, um, because you just... Think it's okay. And you know you need to change, but eh, you'll get around to it, or maybe you won't. Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 22 through 27 says this, verse 22, If you say in your heart, why have these things happened to me? Well, this lines up exactly with today's word, because that's what today's word is. So you look, go through your life, and you're going, I don't know why these bad things are happening to me. Now, certainly not every bad thing happens to you is a result of your own fault or your own sin. We know that the enemy attacks those who are closest to God because he wants to, to, to dethrone those people to get them out of God's presence, right? So we know that, that that's a reality. But a lot of times, we're talking about the opposite of that on today. What we're saying is that a lot of times people don't understand why they're in the same position and condition they've been in for the past 15 or 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Why is nothing changing? Nothing's changing because they're not changing. 
You're not growing towards God. You're not getting any better. You're not seeking after him. You're pointing fingers and blaming other people. You're not putting the work in. You're not putting the effort in. Are you getting up in the morning? Are you praying? Are you walking? Are you, uh, you know, singing songs? Are you worshiping? Are you praising? Are you dancing? Are you clapping? Are you meditating? Are you uh, praying continuously? Are you doing the things that God tells for you to do? Are you putting others' needs before your own needs? Are you being selfless, selfless or selfish? Right? Are you thinking about how you feel? Are you thinking about what he says? I mean, there's so many things we could cover, but at the end of the day, the victim mentality thing to do is to say, why is this happening to me? Now, again, there are things and circumstances that happen in our life that are beyond our control, that are no fault of our own, where we might ask that same question. It's when tragedy strikes, Right? And that's when we depend upon one another and love on one another and uplift one another and help one another. But that's not what I'm talking about today, just to be clear. We're talking about if you're in the wrong and you don't realize you're in the wrong because you're self-deceived and you think that you can, you're not really, and you think, well, no, I've changed. Look at this, look at this. But I guarantee you I can list off five to ten other things about you that you have not changed, where you have not grown, and where it is limiting you and limiting your growth and where you're just deceived. And then you say, well, why is it nothing's changing? Why is it I'm not growing? Why don't I have this? Why don't I have that? Why is these things happening to me? Verse 20, uh, the rest of 22 says, because of the magnitude of your wrongdoing, your skirts have been removed and your heels have suffered violence. Let me define that for you. Because of the magnitude of your wrongdoing, that's pretty self-explanatory, because you've been doing wrong. Now think about that when it says the magnitude of it, that means the, 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 the gravity of it, the, the amount of it, right? The measurable offense of it. Now think about this for one day. Think about if a man or woman was to be selfish. And they're not just selfish once a day, they're selfish 20 times a day. And they're selfish 20 times a day, every day for the last five years. That's a magnitude of wrongdoing. What if they're angry? Anger is, again, the Bible says be angry, but sin not. You have to, as many, many women alike, but especially men, you need to be careful with anger. Right? Because anger, is, you know, there's such a thing as righteous indignation, but don't try to fake out God and say, I'm mad rightfully so, when you're not mad rightfully so, and, and there's no legitimate offense that is taking place that can cause righteous indignation. When you're just pissed off because you've got a spirit of anger. And if somebody, you know, what they call pokes the bear, now all of a sudden you're angry. And you're displaying that anger and you're outwardly anger, angry towards the ones you love, typically first and foremost. Because you always, we've talked about, I've done a sermon on that before too, because you always reach out to the ones and always try to hurt the ones you love the most first because you're most comfortable with them. And you know somewhere in the back of your mind, subconsciously, that maybe they'll, they'll, they'll forgive you. But there is no excuse for the type of anger where we lash out at one another in anger. Now, I'm not talking about your, uh, you know, you know, we really shouldn't have bad days. I'm just having a bad day. You know, I think those who know me and have been around me for 10 plus years know, I don't know. I don't know if I think I might have, I mean, I, now everybody knows I have bad days in the, common, in the context of bad things happen to me days, right? <laughs> Where it's like, well, here's just another thing on my list of, of terrible, uh, just awesome, miraculous things that have uh, transpired and come against me on today. Uh, yeah, yeah, this is another amazing one. Here, write this down. Right? Those are the kind of bad days I have for sure. But days that I just wake up and I'm in, a, I'm in a bad mood and I'm angry and I use my bad mood and my anger as an excuse because of the day that I feel like I'm having. I don't know if those happen. And if they do, it's probably once every five years or once every 10 years. But guess what? I've learned to not allow those to happen because I've learned that I have no excuse. 
I've learned that every day that I wake up is a blessing and it's a day that I have my children. It's a day that I have my wife. It's a day that I have the church. It's a day that I have salvation. It's a day that I still have air to breathe. It's a day that I'm not struggling. All I have to do is look around at the people that are in hospitals or the people that are, you know, whatever the case may be. You know, it's like that old uh, uh, in, Indian, not Native American Indian, but India from India proverb. It says, you know, I cried, I cried because I had no shoes until I met a man who had no feet. And so we always have something to be grateful for. And so waking up with that type of gratitude, I try to make it a purposeful before I go to bed at night to pray and to thank God for what I have and wake up and ask him what he has in store for the day and be prayerful about that. So my point, all that is just to congeal and say, you have no excuse for saying I'm in a bad mood and that's the reason I'm going to have anger. I have anger issues because I have, I'm angry because I've decided that today is a day for me to be angry because I have anger issues. Makes, makes sense. Yelling at, cursing at, pushing, striking, lashing out at, 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 you know, at each other or, or one another, not acceptable behavior. To husbands, the scripture says, husbands, love your wives even as, your, as, Christ loves him, uh, as Christ loves the church. And it says to the women, women, respect your husband, Ephesians 5. But for them to respect your husband, your husband has to give you something to respect. Not just because you're a, you're a man does, do you earn respect. You have to earn respect. That means you have to work for it. And to work for it, yeah, that's a four-letter word in a lot of people's vocabulary. But work means not just work in the context of dollars, but you have to work for your family in order to provide a suitable homestead for them, a suitable house for them, a suitable lifestyle for them, a suitable uh, 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 habitation where they feel safe and they feel protected. So there's no excuse for your anger. There's no excuse for your selfishness. There's no excuse for multiple different things that, are, that you can harbor and hide from yourself and allow to continue to go on and just say that it's okay, I'm just that way. Or a husband to say, to, to, or a wife to look at a husband and go, well, he's just having a bad day. That's the reason he punched me in the eye. You know? Or he's just having, a, or she's just having a bad day. That's the reason she, you know, pinched me and scratched me and cussed at me. You know, I don't understand. That's just not, that's not godly living. That's not righteousness. That's not right. Deal with your issues. Because you have a magnitude of wrongdoing if you continue on that course of action. Then it says your skirts have been removed. So this was talking to both men and women, but basically what it's saying is your skirts have been removed. It's saying that your, your nakedness is on display. In other words, you're laid bare and you're unprotected as a result of this. Because of your wrongdoing... Your protection has been removed from you, and now your most vulnerable bits are exposed, and people see them. That's what it's saying. Because the next verse says, and your heels have suffered violence. We ain't talking about your high heels. We're talking about the heels represents two different things here. Heels is, means like a, a slave who was not afforded shoes, right? They were, or somebody who was severely impoverished couldn't afford shoes. They would walk around and their heels would be split, cracked, and bleeding and, and painful. So it's referencing that. But it's also, this other word heel, is, there's another word for it, where it's basically again saying, your private area has suffered violence. Why? Because it's exposed to the world. And because there's no protection there, it's easily attacked and you're easily wounded. Why have these things happened to me? These things are happening to you because of your wrongdoing, because your protection's been removed, because your darkness has been exposed and you don't want it exposed, but yet it is exposed. 
And now it's going to suffer violence. It's going to suffer an attack and you'll be attacked and then it's going to, you're going to hurt even more, worse. Verse 23, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then you as well can do good who are accustomed to doing evil. So it's saying you can't say, well, you know, that's just the way I am. I can't change. The Bible says, no, you can change. Even a leopard's spots change as it grows. As it gets older, its spots change. And, you know, the Ethiopian, obviously, they have very, very dark skin, but they can change the darkness as they put it there in the sun even longer. Or if they stay out of the sun, then they'll get even lighter. Right? So it's saying, yeah, you can, there, there's room for change. You can change. And we know as we get into the presence of God, we change. Verse 24, Therefore I will scatter them like drifting straw to the desert wind. This is your lot, the portion measured to you from me, declares Yahweh, because you have forgotten me and trusted in falsehood. In other words, just stopping for a moment, it says, I will scatter them like drifting straw to the desert wind. We were driving on the way over here, and there's this big, great open field, and we saw this bag just blowing across the field. It was, just, it was like this big, just tumbling bag. Um, must have been like a feed bag or something. And, and I was thinking about that because it relied directly to, uh, to this Scripture here. I will scatter them like drifting straw to the desert wind. The bag's getting beat up. I mean, it's getting ripped. It's getting shredded. It's, it's dirty. It's, it's just being tossed wherever the wind blows. Who's the prince of the power of the air? And it's getting just beat up. And it's suffering violence as it's being cast out to the desert, to the wind. Says this is your lot, your portion measured to from you. This is what God's going to do to you because you have forgotten me and trusted in falsehood. Again, what does that mean? That means that you have allowed yourself to become deceived because you've placed other things above God. You haven't sought God to change. You haven't been seeking after change. You haven't been seeking after growth. You haven't been seeking and pursuing after Him. So instead, you have allowed yourself to pull away from Him, but still held on to the identity, the false identity that you're of Him and a child of His, but you're nothing like Him. God doesn't act this way. He doesn't lie. He doesn't, he doesn't uh, act out of uh, uh, unrighteous anger. He doesn't steal. He doesn't accuse. He doesn't point fingers. He's not up in everybody's business in a bad way. He's, I mean, all these different things that, that people are doing are not of him. And so the scripture is saying, listen, that's falsehood. That's a lie. That's deception. You're not trusting in God, i.e. you're not pursuing him. To trust him, you have to know him. And to know him, you have to follow him. Because you have forgotten me and trusted in falsehood, so I myself have stripped your skirts over your face so that your shame will be seen. Again, your nakedness, your deeds are exposed. No, no, you know what? Nobody likes, for the most part, nobody likes being looked at where their sin is exposed, where their, their inequities are exposed. Their insecurities are exposed. Nobody wants to, you know, nobody wants everybody looking at them and their nakedness in that spiritual context. Don't look at the dirty part of me. Don't look at the part of me where I'm not doing right. Let me just continue on doing bad. Let me continue on. They, they don't, you know, nobody knows, uh, you know, I, God forbid anybody would know about you know, what, what you're doing about the lies, about the fights, about the yelling, about the cursing, about the pornography, about the... No, I don't want nobody to know about that. But God knows. You haven't hidden anything. Just because sometimes we don't say anything doesn't mean we don't know. It's just that we don't want to expose your nakedness because what we want to do is we want to see you grow. So what we're trying to do is not cover it up like it doesn't exist. We're trying to cover it up with grace so that you can grow away from it and become better. So we're trying to put your skirt back down for you. As for your adulteries and your lustful names. The outrageous sin of your prostitution on the hills in the field. I have seen your abominations. Woe to you, Jerusalem. How long will you remain unclean? How long will you continue to act like this and participate in these things? 
that are not pleasing unto God, how long will you keep faking? How long until you are open your eyes and are able to see clearly what it is that you need to change? so that you can become who you're supposed to be, so that we can be ready for battle for one another and stop letting the enemy win. I mean, the enemy's beating you up all by yourself, but he doesn't even have to do anything. He doesn't even have to do anything. All he has to do is give you one little thought. You're the one who takes the thought and runs with it. All he does is give you the excuse that you have a right to be angry today. You're, hey, good, you're having a bad day. Just tell everybody that and you can act like. That's all he has to do. I read a really cool story the other day. I was going to share it with you today, but I lost it. It was on my phone and then, you know, like it, it went away. And then, so I don't know where it's at, but I'll find it again. But it was exactly on that topic about how the devil really doesn't have to do much. He just has to, do, he just has to push you a little bit in one direction and then you'd go off and do all the sinning. How long will you remain unclean? Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15 through 18. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over the hearts. But whenever someone turns to the Father, the veil is taken away. So, this was talking predominantly about the Jews, right? Whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts, but when someone turns to the Father, the veil is taken away. So whenever you come to the spirit of truth, you embrace the truth, then the veil is taken away to where you can't see it. But to those who are in sin and are stubborn in their heart, I use that word because that's what the scripture says, and it's very clear, when you're stubborn in your heart, people are, I'm just stubborn. Is that, valid, a, valid, is that a valid excuse? No. You can, you, put, you can substitute that word for any other word that you want as it evolves to sin. And, you know, well, you know, I'm just, um, you know, I'm just hungry. That's the reason why, you know, I eat 25,000 calories a day and sit on the couch and watch TV. No, you're covering something up. Right? There's always a root cause. But when the veil is there, it doesn't allow you to see clearly. But you want the veil there so people can't see you and you can't see the truth. The veil is what shields you and protects you unrightfully and unrighteously. And doesn't allow you to see yourself clearly in the mirror. It hides all the blemishes, all the spots, all the wrinkles, all the infection from the enemy. You look at it's that filter that you put over your face so that you can display yourself the way that you want to be seen and the way you want others to see you without exposing the truth of who you really are. I did another sermon on that same th topic a long, long time ago. It was called, I think it was called Let's Get Naked. I know you're going to look that up and go, what in the world? <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> now the Father is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Father is, there is freedom. So therefore, if you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, which is the Spirit of the Father, then there is freedom. He has the ability to set you free from all of this. But guess what? You need more of Him to get it out and to expose it to the light of truth and so that you can take the veil away. Once you remove the veil, then you remove everything that's separating you from him. Separating truth from the lie. Separating truth, darkness from the light. Verse 18, But we all, with unveiled facing, look, looking as in a mirror, at the glory of of Yahweh are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Father, the Spirit. So what he's saying, what unveiled faces, when we remove that veil and we look into the mirror, then we can see his reflection. We see him on the inside of us, and as we continue to pursue him and grow with him and be changed, 
then we go from glory to glory. And every time we look in the mirror, we see more of him. Is that, is that what you want? Do you want to see more of him? Do you want to move from glory to glory? Do you want to change? Do you want to grow? Do you want to become empowered? Do you want to be able to help other people than just yourself? Do you want to be able to come together and says the, uh, the fervent and effectual prayers of the righteous availeth much? Do you want to be able to come together and pray together and have your prayer heard so that you can effectuate change over somebody's life? Right now, today, by the grace of God, there's no tragedy that I'm aware of in our midst in the body. But nobody knows what tomorrow brings. And I can guarantee you, whether it's in my family or in your family, if their tragedy occurs, I want prayer warriors who are going to be able to stand up and fight so that we can pray and overcome the enemy, overcome the tragedy, overcome the fallen world, so that we can heal and deliver whatever it is needs to be healed and delivered by God's power and His grace. But we need to be changed up, powered up, and ready to fight that fight, to remove that veil, to grow, so we can grow into His image. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 through 9 says, Therefore, treat the parts of your earthly body as dead to sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed. Well, a lot of you think, well, that's, that's not necessarily me, right? Sexual immorality primarily is talking about <coughs> LGBTQ plus all that, right? That's just sexual immorality and pride. Okay, we got that. Impurity. That means not having a pure heart. Not being, you know, having the heart that's defiled or allowing parts of your heart to remain that aren't of God because you enjoy that. Boy, I could talk about that for a long time. Just give me a second. I'm going to try to revisit. Passion. That's talking about passions that aren't of God. Evil desire and greed, which amounts to idolatry. Now, notice how these things amount to idolatry. Again, let me just be clear. You say, I would never do idolatry. I would never pray to an idol. I would never pray to a wooden statue. I would never bow down to that. But he says this here, these things are even idolatry because those things you put above God. Greed is an idol. Evil desire is an idol. Sexual immorality is an idol. These are all hooks that Satan hooks into you and draws you and drags you after himself. It's like, you know, it's like, you know you're like the... Uh, just hooked on a line and he's just dragging you into the, the mouth of the shark that's waiting for you in the abyss. Right? You, you took the bite when you shouldn't have. For it's because of these things that the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. So you were once a son or a child of disobedience because you were a son or, and daughter not of God but of the enemy, of the God of this world. You were a son or child of disobedient. But if you are obedient now, then you're no longer a son of disobedience or a daughter of disobedience. You belong to God. But you, we all came out of darkness. We all came out of sin. And we've all come into his light when we accept him and follow after him. It's just, are you still following after him? Do you still love him? Do you still want to be saved? Or do you just want to go alone to get along? Because again, I can guarantee you, if you're just trying to go alone to get along you are definitely in the wrong place. There's a, a, any church on the corner. Just go there. They do that. We don't. But now, you also rid yourselves of all of them. Okay, here we go. He's talking about the stuff you need to rid yourself of. And it was also, this would be immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, greed. Okay. But now also rid yourselves, all of them, of anger. Okay, that's, we know that's not of God. Wrath, malice, that bad intent, slander, talking bad about folks with the intent to hurt them, obscene speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you stripped off the old self with its evil practices. So do not lie to one another since you stripped off the old self with its evil practices. I want to hit on that for just one second. Don't lie to one another. Another way of also is saying don't lie to yourself. Since you stripped off the old, now remember we've been talking a lot about skirts coming up over your head, nakedness being exposed, and here it says you stripped off the old self, and remember the old self also means the old man. Since you got rid of the old man with its evil practices, don't lie and say that you're saved when you're still carrying the dead man around. You haven't ripped him off, you're still holding on to him. 
You still have parts of your heart that are tainted, that you allow to be tainted because it's comfortable and you don't want to have to deal with it. You still have people in your life that shouldn't be in your life because you know they're not saved. You know they're not of God. You know you shouldn't fellowship with them. You know you shouldn't let them effectuate your attitude, your emotions, your heart. You shouldn't let them do that to you. But the reason that they're doing that to you is because you're biting the hook. It's because you are allowing them into your heart and into your mind and into your life when the scripture says, come out from amongst them and be separate. You're called to go in and be a witness to them, to pray for them, but then you're called to be separate from them. Don't let them into your mind. Don't let them into your heart because you're making room for the enemy. Come on, did that make sense to anybody but me? Don't let them back in. Come out from amongst them and be separate. Strip off the old man and the old ways and those people of the old life and become new in Christ, a new creature who God has called you to be so that you can grow. How are you ever going to grow when you're still carrying the old man around with you? And how are you ever going to grow when you're carrying all those people that you're connected and attached to and hanging out with you shouldn't be hanging out with? You'll never ever grow because they're still dragging you and holding you back. Because you have not been willing to let go of them and let God take care of them. You're trying, you're being an idol, you're allowing God, you're thinking that you can make things better for them. But in reality, you can't make anything better for them, only He can. You're called to be the mouthpiece of God and to be an example of God in the way that you walk. Let them see your growth, let them see your success, let them see you change your spots. Let them see you reflect His glory. But you're not ever going to grow if you're still holding them around and dragging them around with you in heart or in mind. Ephesians 4, verse 22 through 24. Then in reference to your former way of life, which means your old life, your sin life, which you've come out of, you are to rid yourselves of the old man or of the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. And that you are to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. So there's no excuse for the old corrupted man. You're called to die. Cut that off. You're called to just completely circumcise him. Remove that flesh from your body and from your mind. We just got through talking about it, but this scripture just kind of backs it up again and telling the same thing. Get rid of the anger. Get rid of the lies, get rid of the despair, get rid of the depression, get rid of everything that the enemy tried to place upon you and everything you willingly accepted in that's not of God. Get rid of that. Cut it off. Didn't the Bible tell us, didn't Christ say, didn't the Father say that when you have the Father's Spirit on the inside of you, there is freedom. He provides freedom for you. He is the key that unlocks every chain and every cuff and everything that binds you. You just have to be willing to accept the key. The key, when a key turns, what does it do? It unlocks and it changes the locking mechanism so that whatever is bound must release. He is the key to life. What did he give to Peter? The keys to create change. Where do we have change? On the inside of us when we grow and become more like him because we have those same keys because he's given us the key because he is the key to life. He is the freedom. So we just need to set some people free that are chained to us to get rid of them because we're just dragging dead weight around. We're dragging zombies and corpses. And they're going to bring us down. It doesn't mean you have to not forget them and not pray for them and not try to save them, but it does mean that we shouldn't carry them around. And the same thing goes with mentality, with our mind, the way that we think, the way that we act, the way our attitude and all that kind of stuff. I mean, is that, you know, if, I, if we were to, remember, you're going to be given an account for every word that you speak. <coughs> Let's just say... You know how they have those, I, don't, I, don't, I guess I don't even know if they have them anymore, but you know, you remember 
however many long years ago, 15 years ago it was, they started off with those like reality shows and they had cameras inside people's houses and it was like 24 seven. Like every day, like every single word they said, every single thing that they did was recorded. What if we had those on you? And you say, okay, this week we're gonna watch Amanda. And but Amanda didn't know she was being recorded. Amanda, what would we see? Don't answer that. <laughs> what would we see in your behavior pattern? Are, are, you, are you somebody different when you sit here? Are you pretending to be somebody that you're not? Or are you accurately looking yourself in the mirror and going, yeah, I need to change some things. I need to grow. I need to stop this. I don't have a right to be angry. I don't have a right to act this way. I don't have a right to lie. I don't have a right to treat this person this way on a right to deceive myself because in essence all I'm doing is hurting Christ on the cross. I'm adding more pain, more suffering to him through me not being willing to remove the veil that which separates from me and I'm hurting people around me because I'm not able to be there for them in the capacity that God created me to be because I've allowed myself to stay in this position for too long with a veiled face. That in reference to your former way of life, you are to rid yourselves of the old man, which is being corrupted according to the lust of seed, and you are to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self. That's phys- You have to be responsible for that action. Put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness, holiness of the truth. I don't, even need to, I don't even need to talk about that. Just do it. Now, let me finish up by saying this. We were created in God's image. When he formed man, he formed man. I want you to see this because it's important. But whenever he formed man, he formed man from the earth. Remember, he formed Adam first, right? Right? And as he formed Adam first, he formed him from the earth, and then he breathed life, he breathed life into him, and the man became a living being. And he called him Adam, which means man. But it's also formed from two different words. Okay, dam, which means blood. We sing that song all the time. Hodamo. So dam means blood. Okay? And so when we look at that way, the word Adama means ground or earth. So if the, and there, it's sad that the reason that not only because of the blood, but also because the clay that he, or the earth that he moved it from was like red dirt in that same way. So in essence, when he formed man, it was like a, forming like a red man almost, if you will. And in forming of that man, out of the ground, that's why, you know, we get the saying ashes to ashes, dust to dust, whatever, right? So Adam, because he was the first man, and then when you get the sons of men, which is B'nai Adam, which means mankind or human, right? It's the same word, place where we, we get this word um, human from. And so it comes from Adam because we came from the earth. So... How is that differentiated from animals, I guess, is where I was going with that in, in, in just a small part. We're not going to talk about the total differentiation. But animals were, built, uh, were created almost complete in their creation. Let me just give you an example, right? Um, maybe it's a deer. That deer, from the t- time it's very young while maybe not able to defend for itself completely, for sure, but it's able, it's, it, it walks, it's, it's up walking pretty quick. It's able to drink pretty quick. It's able to nurse pretty quick. It's able to run with its mother pretty quick, right? The lifespans are relatively short in comparison to ours. And there's not a lot of mental change. There is some, but not a lot of mental change that takes place over the course of time, right? Their behavior patterns are pretty similar when they're young from when they're old and they're older. There's not a whole lot different, even though there is some differences. Okay. Man, on the other hand, 
as human beings, we all know how we're born. I mean, we're just blobs of cuteness, right? I mean, we're just incapable of doing anything in and of ourselves. I mean, you leave a baby in a field, I mean, that's it. It's over. Babies have to be nurtured. They have to be cared for. I'm not going to tell you anything you don't know here. And then we grow up and we should change and change and change and change. Why? Because we are co- we came from the ground and everything that's in the ground must be cultivated. It must be grown. It must be cared for. It must be watered. It must be fed. And it has life cycles and ch- it changes and it must be, have the light shine on it. Photosynthesis. So we came out of the ground in this way, so our mind and our spirit must continually be cultivated, must continually be watered, must continually be exposed to the light of life. And in so doing, we will change and we will continue like a plant. We will continue to grow. And guess what? The taller we get, the closer we get to God in a spiritual sense. The more room we make for him. So we have to cultivate our body our mind, and our spirit and allow God to continue to grow us because it's a continual spiritual evolutionary process. Even the scripture talks about this process when it talks about that we would be enlightened in the eyes of our heart, that we would come to know God in that way where God's light shines on us and shines in us and we grow Again, from glory to glory and grace to grace when we see his reflection, when we look back in that mirror and we remove the veil and we're not hiding anything anymore. But we just want to become who he wants us to be as we move forward. We want to be the red man, the man that's covered in the blood of Christ and continue to grow and moving into his image. Amen? Amen. As you stand. I pray on today that this is not a word that goes unheeded. I pray this is not a word that you walk away from and just go, you know what? Um, Yeah, that was good. Yeah, I know I need to work on some stuff. Uh, I'll get to it. And then tomorrow comes and you forget about it and you're just, oh, well. Because if that occurs, you'll never change. You'll never grow. Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you for your desire for us to become more like you and to have more of you on the inside of us. For us to move from glory to glory, for us to move from faith to faith, that we would continue to abide in your presence and in your love and the love, your love on the inside of us continue to overwhelm us and continue to grow us and continue to change us where we don't just seek self, where we just don't seek what our own desires are, where we put each other's needs that are within the body even before our own, that we seek to become the best man that we can be, the man that provides, protects as the priest of our home and the lovers of our wives and our children, that we be the best woman, the woman that nurtures, the woman that cleans, the woman that takes care of, the woman that cooks, the woman that provides the atmosphere in the home, the woman um, that respects her husband and respects you and puts you first above all things, a Proverbs 31 woman. Father, we pray that you would continue to change us, that you would remove that veil that lies over our eyes, each one of us in particular, even right now, that when we go home from this place, we would look in the mirror, spiritually speaking, and we would see everything that needs to be changed. We'd see every blemish. We'd see every darkness. We'd see everything that we have attached to, that's attached to us that needs to be stripped away. That we would see it and not just say, it's okay, I wasn't born this way, but we'd be willing to change. And that change would come through your power, through your strength and your might. And we know we can't strip it away ourselves, but we know through your spirit that when, when you have your spirit on the inside of us, that you have the capability and you have to set us free from all things because there's freedom in your spirit. You are the key that unlocks everything. Let us reach up and take hold of those keys and unlock our freedom today. Freedom from oppression, freedom from depression, freedom from anger, freedom from sexual immorality, freedom from every single thing, Father, that uh, we've held on to and we didn't want people to see. We didn't want people to expose us and to see our nakedness and to see our despair. But instead, Father, today, let our skirts be lifted up in your sight. 
so that we can truly see what's underneath, what it is we've been trying to remain hidden, so that we, Father, can be make, made pure, holy, and clean, and precious in your sight, so that we could grow and come into your presence, for we know darkness can't stand in your presence, but we know if it's exposed to light, we ask for you today to burn it away. Father, I pray for those who are here, and even receiving this word, even from afar, I pray, Father, that they would not be able to remain in any semblance of peace while these things still reside on the inside of them until they acknowledge them and begin to deal with them so that they can become more like you, so they can become pure, so they can come clean, so that they can grow in you and you grow in them. Let there be no more faking, Father. Let there be no more hypocrisy. Let your love change us so that we can bind together and we can help those and we can stand together with more of you in us in the time of need. We thank you. We love you. Let your love overwhelm us enough to inspire us to change and to grow and to not think what we're something that we're not, but to be honest and honest with, one, with each other, not lie to each other. In Yeshua's name, amen. amen. <coughs> Today's message title was Red Man, because we want God's blood to cover us. We were created in his image. We have the image of the Son, who is in the image of man, and we have the image of the Father, who is spirit. So we have man who has the spirit on the, of the Father on the inside of us, that has set us free. So we're no longer the first Adam, but we're the second Adam, Christ. Where Adam sinned and Adam fell, the second Adam came, which was Christ. He came in the blood because he was the blood and in the blood is life and he gave his blood for us that we might have life. So we accept that life, we accept that price, we accept that blood, that that blood would cover us. So today our dismissal shout would be, I will be the second Adam. On the count of three. One, two, three. I will be the second Adam. Amen. You are dismissed with hugs of love. Go home and do some changing. Amen.